This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, tens of thousands of Haitians in the U.S. remain here on temporary protected status following the devastating earthquake in their country in 2010. But they may soon be forced to return home. We'll find out why. And later we'll learn of a New Haven program that brings refugees and the community together around food. But first, when Pakistani-American Kizar Khan lost his son, U.S. Army Captain Humayun Khan, to a car bomb in Iraq in 2004, he and his wife became Gold Star Family, referencing the Gold Star pins the military gives to parents who lose a son or daughter while serving the country. Some also hang Gold Star flags in their homes. The Khans grieved privately back then, but it all changed last July when Kizer Khan addressed the Democratic National Convention and criticized then-Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump for disrespecting Muslims and other minorities. Donald Trump, you're asking Americans to trust you with their future. Let me ask you, have you even read the United States Constitution? I will, I will gladly lend you my copy. Since then, candidate Trump has become President Trump. And Kizer Khan has remained in the spotlight, too, as a constitutional rights advocate. He'll be in Norwalk, Connecticut tomorrow for a fundraiser hosted by the Connecticut chapter of the Council of American Islamic Relations. Mr. Khan joins us by phone from his home in Virginia. Uh, Kizer Khan, welcome to where we live. Thank you. Good to speak with you and good to speak with your audience. Now, prior to last summer, Mr. Khan, you lived a private life. You were out of the spotlight. Now people around the country know your face. Some would say you're now one of the most recognizable Muslim Americans in this country. What's that last several months been like for you? Well, first, I always, always introduce myself as a patriotic American, and uh, and that is my fate, and that is how I uh, have uh, come to be known, and I'm delighted for that. I am honored. I am a grateful American citizen with all the dignities of constitutions bestowed upon me. I am I'm, I'm a grateful and humble person. We remain private people. Things have been difficult to some extent, lack of privacy and lack of uh, safety. Uh, But we have seen face to face, we have been among the patriots, the goodness of America that we have enjoyed. And uh, people have been very kind, very thoughtful, very encouraging. and, uh, and, and, And we are humbled by all that. Uh, and it continues. We have taken some precaution for our safety and for our peace of mind. So those things are in very good hands. But we are we are humbled and modest citizen and grateful citizen of this country. Uh, you mentioned a lack of privacy and, and at times a worry about safety. What have you been experiencing when you talk about um, safety issues? Well, and we stepped into this limelight, into this public arena, full well knowing our well-wishers have told us that there will be lack of privacy, there will be threats, and there will be challenges to your credibility, to your well-being and all. So we have received our share of, be it email or telephones, but overwhelmingly, if you came our home, you will see overwhelming uh, love and affection and courtesy and dignity that had been showered by this nation, and we remain very grateful. We don't dwell on the negativity that uh, comes with territory, but we are very positive about the future of our country. We are very positive uh, about the nation and its values of our country, so we focus on that mostly. Tell us a little bit of your backstory, uh, Kizer Khan. Um, you've been living in this country for, I understand, 40 years. What brought you here? Well, the pursuit of my education brought me here, and uh, uh, which I have completed. I have become a member of several bars. I am uh, uh, a currently practicing attorney. I haven't worked 
since last year an hour mostly my time had been spent on speaking so it was the pursuit of education that brought me to this country and we have had some exposure of the genuineness and about the sincerity about the hard work and the good values of america before coming to america so when we came here in 1980 we were just amazingly impressed at the decency and the care and at the genuineness of of America that has kept us here. You mentioned earlier that when you travel, you always introduce yourself as an American first. You see yourself as a patriot. I read that back in March, you had reached your 89th speaking engagement since that speech at the Democratic National Convention. Why do you travel so often? Why do you speak to these community groups? Yeah. My speaking all, uh, I am to number 108 now. Uh, but these invitations come. I, I have not solicited any of that. Uh, all of these speaking engagements, interviews, conversations with various communities of all sorts, these are unsolicited. And these invitations come, and communities invite, and I go to speak. Of course, they make arrangements for me to travel and all that, but I do all of this pro bono uh, because I feel that our communities, and especially the communities of faith, are concerned, minorities are concerned about the direction that, unfortunately, uh, my, my country has taken momentarily so my, I find my role as a patriot citizen to share the concerns that exist among various communities. And then in my, my non-political but uh, in my humble as a patriot citizen way, suggest what could be done because we are a peaceful country, we are peaceful people, we must resort to peaceful means to get our concerns addressed through Congress, through government, through protests, through speaking, through joining hands, through coming together, calling our senators, calling our congressmen, and uh, asking them to address and pay attention to our concerns. And Mr. Khan, what are your concerns? We, you know, President Trump has now passed uh, 100 days uh, um, in the Oval Office, uh, that he has issued some controversial executive orders. They've been blocked in court. When you look back at those first 100 days, what concerns you and what gives you hope? My hope was that after the results of the election, the incoming administration will do one thing very first day because they themselves have acknowledged that the country is divided. The nation is divided like never before. But their first day would be to unite people, to bring them together because you can only successfully govern a nation like United States by uniting people, by bringing them together. And that still remains hope. That had been a disappointment, that no loud message has been delivered or steps have been taken to unite the country. So that is one, the division that remains. Second, various executive orders and various steps have further divided the country. But what has been heartening throughout this process that and I speak to that, that democracy like ours, republic like ours, is nothing but tyranny of majority. And in our system of government, rule of law is what addresses if majority begins to take some steps that are not according to our system, that are beyond constitution, the rule of law will prevail. So... You see the Muslim ban executive orders, rule of law has prevailed, Uh, building of wall. Congress has stepped in that they will not fund such an election announcement. Of course, we are for the safety and security and some systematic immigration in this country. A country like United States must have immigration policy like our neighbors to the north Canada has. 
we have immigration laws, but your audience and you probably will be surprised to know that we have no immigration policy. And immigration issues must be addressed, must be addressed humanely, must be addressed in the best interest of United States, not by political rhetoric, by bigoted statements and announcements and then trying to deal with these things, uh, putting a patch here and patch there. It requires deliberation, uh, consideration, joining hands with uh, the both parties and their leadership and administration to solve the immigration problems that we have. So my hope and my heartening come from a strong belief in rule of law in the United States. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. I'm speaking with Kizer Khan. He's a gold star father. He's become a constitutional rights advocate after delivering uh, a memorable speech at the Democratic National Convention uh, last summer. Uh, Mr. Khan will be in Connecticut this weekend uh, speaking at a Council of American Islamic uh, Relations uh, fundraiser in Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, now, Mr. Khan, even before uh, the election of Donald Trump uh, last November, um, FBI, uh, has been tracking uh, hate incidents uh, going up uh, among uh, many different populations uh, in this country. When you go to these events and you speak about the need to remember what the Constitution uh, promises us as Americans and this message of equality, what do you hear from the audience? What are their concerns? Their concerns are, of course, the same throughout the country. Where are we going? What has happened to our values of tolerance, of pluralism, of patience, of accepting neighbors, and they ask for answers, they ask for solutions. And my answer always had been the same, which is, first, we remain peaceful. Second, we reject this un-American hatred. It has nothing to do with American values. It is totally against the values of America. So you would say, well, should we just have open borders and uh, let everyone and anyone come in? No, no, not at all. We should have very strict immigration policy. We should have policy, not just the haphazard, uh, capricious implementation implementation of the laws, whoever feels whichever way and all that, and then begin to scare our neighbors, our various minorities, uh, people of faith, people of different faith. So that is what I I share, protest, but peacefully reject this un-American hate that had spiked since the election. America was built on pluralism. America was built on welcoming all faiths and all communities. And that is what most America is. Uh, Mr. Khan, just a couple more questions. But I was wondering, do you still travel with your pocket constitution? And what part truly speaks to you? Well, I I have, uh, since 2005, uh, we have had uh, a packet of Constitution. Whenever people, visitors would come, I would share with them. Yes, I do travel. Look, not only to my American friends, but I have shared this with the rest of the world. And the rest of the world had become so curious. They have sent their media people to find out what is enshrined in this document that This individual, this American talks about and carries this Constitution, those had been first. I urge your audience, please read Declaration of Independence first before you read articles and amendments. Everything will begin to make sense. What sacrifice we rendered to have this blessed nation. It didn't come without sacrifice. So that is first. Second, people call them Bill of Rights, amendments to the Constitution, I don't call them that. Those are human dignities. Read them one more time, and you will see why I call them human dignities. First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, Section 1 is my most favorite. And that is where lie the human dignities, because our Creator has created us with these dignities. Some parts of the world are ruled and dictated by authoritarian regimes. You go into that because I have spoken to those people. They all wish to have 
what we are blessed with through this Constitution. So I always carry it. I make reference to it. I show it to the people. A few days ago, I shared with an audience first five words of these dignities, the First Amendment. It says, Congress shall make no law. Those five words mean so very much for thoughtful Americans. This Constitution is prohibiting the, the Congress, which is the House of Majority, that you cannot legislate any laws that abridge these privileges and these immunities that are enshrined in the Constitution, whereas most constitutions of the world authorize the Congress or parliament to legislate law about freedom of speech, legislate laws about unreasonable search and seizure, or protest against the government. But this constitution, these dignities, prohibit the Congress, the House of Majority, that you cannot legislate laws on these privileges and immunities and these human dignities that are enshrined in the amendment. The 14th Amendment, Section 1, remains my most favorite. You probably have your critics uh, since the time that you spoke at the DNC convention who wonder why you've um, you know, decided to become public uh, with your story since losing your son again. Um, he was killed by a car bomb uh, serving uh, in Iraq. Uh, he was a U.S. Army captain. Um, what do you say to them? Well, I respect their opinion. I hope they respect my, my privilege. They respect my freedom to speak. We have privately, peacefully, in the dignity of our family, grieved for 12 years. This is 13th year that Captain Imayun Khan died in protecting his men and women and others that were under his jurisdiction, under his a responsibility of keeping them safe. He offered his life to save them. It was in that spirit. First, we did not accept the invitation immediately. We hesitated. We sat for two days pondering, should we accept or shouldn't we accept? But then the grace with which Captain Himayun Khan left, which was protecting others, speaking on behalf of others, it is under that grace that we accepted. After the bigoted statement of now President Trump, then candidate, he made the statement, I will ban Muslim throughout all Hispanics. Women deserve no equal respect. Judges are partial. Parents with small children in our private capacity would approach and would say, you're an attorney, can you tell us, would our children be thrown out? They're born here, they're citizens. Same thing, children will ask, can we finish our school? Can you make sure our parents are not thrown out from here? But we are citizens of this country now. And I would assure them that don't worry, this is just a political speech. Nothing of that sort will happen, but children remain worried. So such were the circumstances under which we accepted the invitation. We broke our silence. We became public. We spoke on behalf of those worried children. I continue to speak on their behalf. So it is that that I offer to those who criticize. Uh, that is the beauty of America, that I can have a difference of opinion as long as we extend the same courtesy to the other that does not agree with our opinion. And Mr. Khan, uh, you mentioned that you've had 108 uh, public speaking engagements uh, since the convention last summer. How much longer will you do this? And, and what do you think your son would uh, think uh, as he sees his father uh, traveling around the country talking about um, his love of the United States, but also the importance of our Constitution? As long as I am needed, I don't seek these speaking engagements. As I mentioned, that all of these engagements have been unsolicited. I have engagements that keep coming through December and beyond, and uh, I am very selective, very careful, so that uh, my words are not misused or not exploited. So I speak carefully. I speak uh, 
which I will continue to do. I've been blessed with these dignities and with these privileges. I find myself convinced that in time of need, it is a duty of every patriotic, grateful citizen of a country that has given us so very much to my whole family, so very much. This is the humblest way that I can say thank you to my nation, thank you to my country. I will continue to do that as long as I'm needed, as long as I'm invited. And uh, it's, a, it's a very simple and it's a very plain message that I, I convey, which is let's remain peaceful, let's, let's remain hopeful, let's remain faithful to the constitutional values and the dignities that are enshrined. And, uh, and this journey will continue. I've been speaking with Kizar Khan, a Pakistani-American and Gold Star father. He's known for his speech at the Democratic National Convention last July when he challenged then presidential candidate, presidential nominee rather, Donald Trump, to respect the rights of all Americans. Since then, Mr. Khan has become an advocate for constitutional rights and travels the country to speak to community groups. He'll be the featured speaker at a Council of American Islamic Relations of Connecticut event tomorrow in Norwalk, Connecticut. Mr. Khan, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much. Good to speak with you, and thank you to your audience as well. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we'll find out why tens of thousands of Haitians in the U.S. may soon be forced to leave. That's after the break. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Earlier this week, NPR reported that thousands of Haitians who are living in the U.S. could be forced to leave the country. They've lived here under a special immigration designation known as temporary protected status. To find out more, we're joined by Philip Burns, an immigration attorney in Stamford, Connecticut, also a former Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador and Haiti. Philip, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, first, you know, do we know how many Haitians live in Connecticut, and if you could explain what this TPS program actually does? Um, I, I think the best estimates as to the number of Haitians in Connecticut is probably about uh, uh, 30,000, give or take. Um, and um, I'm sorry, what was the second half of the question? About temporary protected status. What is it? What is it? How does it help them? <clears throat> well, temporary protected status is... Um, is a part of the immigration law that says that uh, if the United States government decides that there's a disaster in a particular country that is bad enough and affects enough of a country that continuing to deport uh, people from the United States to that country would further destabilize that country and also simply would be uh, inhumane, that the U.S. government can decide uh, we're going to just give the people from that country, country a temporary status in the U.S. <clears throat> for, um, for example, in 2010, there was the earthquake in Haiti that so shattered that country that the, the U.S. decided, okay, if we continue to deport the undocumented Haitians living in the U.S. to Haiti, A, it's inhumane to them, and B, will further destabilize things in Haiti, so we're going to extend temporary protected status to the Haitians living in the U.S. It's not the first time the U.S. Has governed, the U.S. government has done it. It, it gave uh, temporary protected status to people from Sierra Leone because of the uh, civil war going on there, to uh, Hondurans because of the uh, 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 Hurricane Mitch back in 1998, to uh, Salvadorians because of the earthquake that took place there, to uh, people from the Caribbean island of Montserrat because of the uh, volcano that took place in 1986. One of the other great benefits of TPS is that um, by uh, not deporting uh, people <clears throat> from that country and by then giving them these temporary work permits, they can then go out and get uh, better paying jobs, uh, jobs that pay one, two, three dollars an hour more, make a little bit more money, and send more money back to their relatives, which is uh, one of the most efficient uh, ways of, uh, of, of providing foreign aid possible. You, you have absolutely no overhead. Somebody makes $100 here, it costs them you know, one or two dollars to send a Western Union back home, 
and that family back home gets that money directly and immediately and right away and can spend it on food in the first uh, few weeks or months and then rebuilding their homes thereafter. You mentioned uh, TPS for Haitians began in in 2010. Um, Tell us what, I mean, there's been a lot, Haiti has been struck by a lot of natural disasters, even a cholera outbreak in that country. I mean, how bad is it right now? Well, it's bad enough that the United States government has every year and a half, because TPS has been, TPS typically is extended for a year and a half at a time. uh, And every year and a half, the government reviews whether it's, whether the situation uh, continues to warrant the extension of TPS for another year and a half, and it and has continued to extend uh, Haitian TPS every year and a half since 2010. And <clears throat> you know we can we can look at uh, Honduran TPS, uh, which uh, began after the uh, the hurricane in 2000. I'm sorry, in 1998, and it has been extended uh, every year and a half for the last 19 years. And the um, after the uh, volcano in the island of Montserrat in 1986, that continued until just last year. So that continued for 30 years. I asked that question because it's the administration, a Trump administration official um, in the USCIS that recommended that that TPS not be extended past January, um, saying that conditions in Haiti have improved. Well, I guess um, they have a different way of looking at it than, um, than, uh, than the than the Obama administration, than the Bush administration before them, and uh, you know, looking at uh, looking at all the prior TPS uh, grants before them. I mean, going back to 1986, that was uh, the Reagan administration that, that granted uh, TPS to the people from Montserrat. They, are, you know, as, as they've shown in many ways, they have a different way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. I wanted to bring into the conversation now um, Merlin Courtois. She uh, lives in Stanford, um, is a resident living under this designation, temporary protected status in the United States. Uh, Merlin, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Tell us about when you came to Connecticut and why. Um, uh, we, before I came with a visa, I was travel and uh I was I used to travel uh before the earthquake and uh, the earthquake happened I was here and I cannot go back and there is nothing to go back to. Mm. And so the the government decided to grant us with temporary uh, protection with CPS and we was really blessed with that and really happy. Mm. And also I would like to thank all those American people with the good heart who help us survive that catastrophe. And uh, on behalf of all my people and my government, I would like to thank all American people mm-hmm. for all the good things they do for us. But it's not enough. And the country still start to get in a little better. And here we can mask you come in and break everything down, like the Southwest is all gone. No crops, no houses, no trees, nothing left. Mm. And so if the government decides to send 10,000 people back there, it looks like put another problem and tap another one. Mm. So you're under temporary protected status. You've lived here with your daughter for more than eight years. Uh, if that expires, you know, what will life be like for you if you have to return? Oh, it's, well, well, it's going to be a painful, not only for me, because we hear all those people who have CPS, grant CPS, who live here, and they work not only for themselves, and they work to help other people. They send, we send what we can, not only for our, our family, and we help other people or their kids to go to school. Because some people, they, they, they get up, they sleep, they don't see any, anything for the next day. If they don't have a friend or somebody who lives outside the country to, to, um, to, to give them something or to send them something, they don't know what they're going to do. That means if the government decided to send us back, 10,000 people, and we don't know 
what the future is going to be and what that's going to be on top of all those problems already there. And you have a, a daughter, I understand she's 17, uh, again, has been going to school in the United States for uh, more than eight years. You know, what's her reaction when she hears that she may, you know, she may have to go back to Haiti? Oh, um, since I heard that, and I can't sleep, and she can, she cannot sleep. She said, Mom, what are we going to do? She tried to find every little detail. Uh, what are we going to do? I want to have my education. And she's been dreaming that since she was six. She told me, Mom, I am not like everyone. I, 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 I born an intellectual. I want to be somebody, and I want to help people, to help a lot of people. And my, and my, my, and my uh, fairy tale, I saw a lot of people who had problems, like mental problems. That's why I try to, to see if I can fix them. I say, how are you going to fix them, Tanisha? She said to me, if I go to school, I learn something good. If I found some place, I can learn, learn, and I think I can do it, Mom, and I want to do that. And that means uh, she's been here. I have work day and night because I don't have any support. And I don't find any help anywhere and um, to send her to school, to college. And I have to work day and night, of course, with uh, help from with some couple of people who help me to and achieve that um, that achievement. And that's why I I am so thankful because I am here. I can work even I work daytime. I forgot about myself just to get her education. Mm. And that's why we're here for, and we, we, we Haitian people, we are good people. We're resilient, and we hard workers. And kid, the kids, they're smart. But because there is a, not a good structure in Haiti, that's why they can't achieve more than they, they're capable. And I, what I would like to ask the American people and the government, if they have a little space in their heart to renew the TPS for the Haitian people, this will be a blessing. Mm. Because we have dignity, we have everything, but the, the country doesn't have the job, the, the economy is not good, and the, cat, the catastrophe, I think, is one and top another. And there is no way we can survive that uh, problem if they mm. send all of us back there. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Uh We're learning a little bit about the Temporary Protected Status Program. This is a designation the federal government gives uh, to nationals from other countries when disaster strikes. It allows them to remain in the U.S. and to legally work. Uh, Merlin Courtois lives in Stanford um, with her daughter. Uh, she's a native of Haiti, and she's been living in this country under TPS. Also on the conversation with us is Philip Burns, an immigration attorney in Stanford. Um, we are hearing that TPS could end in January if uh, the Homeland Security Secretary Kelly um, uh, agrees with uh, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services that there should not be an extension of TPS for Haiti, uh, Haitians, Philip. So what happens? Explain the process uh, that's underway and, and what do you think will happen later this May with that decision coming? Um, actually, I think it might end in July, not January, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, uh, I, well, if it, if it ends... <clears throat> the um, the many tens of thousands of, of Haitians uh, across the country, and uh, probably a, <clears throat> a couple thousand uh, here in Connecticut, will uh, lose their protections. They will lose their work permits. Uh, most of them will probably lose their jobs, uh, <clears throat> and they'll they'll go back in you know back into the shadows. They'll they'll become undocumented immigrants again, uh, and. Uh, They'll start getting deported again. <clears throat> so they'll have been basically quasi legal for the last seven years and suddenly become uh, illegal, if you will, again. Uh, <clears throat> their children, uh, like uh, Mirlan's uh, daughter, who's now in college uh, and trying to get a degree uh, in psychology so she can uh, be a useful and contributing member of society, 
will suddenly uh, become an undocumented immigrant. And uh, it's going to throw a lot of lives uh, out of kilter. Uh, her daughter, like many young children who came to United, many young immigrant children who came to the United States, very young, <clears throat> grew up as Americans and have little if no memory, <clears throat> uh, little if any memory, <clears throat> and in many cases no memory of their home countries. They grew up as Americans. They feel Americans. They're Americans uh, in their in every sense of the word, except legally. And deporting them would be like plucking any American child out of their home and sending them to a foreign country. They're going to be fish out of water. Uh, and it's just as inhumane as you can possibly be uh, to, 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 to send them to a country that they have no knowledge of, mm. simply because they were born there, uh, because they grew up in this country uh, and they, they're socialized as Americans. And they're going to, you know, it'd be like exiling them from not just the lives they've known, but the society they grew up in. Philip Burns is an immigration attorney in Stanford, Connecticut, also a former Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador and Haiti. Uh, Philip, are you hearing from uh, other Haitians in Connecticut um, besides uh, Merlin who are worried about their status? <clears throat> I've, I've heard of uh, groups of uh, Haitians who are trying to get together and uh, requesting the assistance of um, uh, our, our, uh, our congressmen, uh, Congress represent, congressional representatives, um, but there's really not that much they can do. This is uh, completely within the purview of the executive. Uh, TPS is uh, something that the executive decides uh, on its own. So, you know, there can be political pressure brought on, but there's nothing legally that can be done to, to compel uh, uh, the president and the administration to decide that uh, Haiti continues to be a, uh, a, a dangerous place, uh, an unsafe place, and a place that will be further destabilized by deporting <clears throat> tens of thousands of people back there, an inhumane act to deport tens of thousands of people back there, and cutting off the source of funds of many families that are that are kept alive there because they have family here that is making money and sending money back home. Well, I want to thank you, Philip, for um, explaining this program to us. Again, Philip Burns, immigration attorney in Stanford. Also, Merlin Courtois, thank you so much for sharing your story, Merlin. Well, thank you for having me. She lives in Stanford with her daughter under what's called temporary protected status, that designation allowing Haitians to remain in the U.S. until they can return home. It started again in 2010 when an earthquake devastated Haiti, left tens of thousands of Haitians dead. Now an official within the Trump administration has recommended that TPS not be renewed for Haitians, and that decision uh, may be coming down later this month about when that program officially expires. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. After the break, we hear about a new program in New Haven that uses food as a tool for cultural exchange. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up Monday, more than a year ago, Scott Semple, the commissioner of the State Department of Correction, visited Germany with the governor to see what lessons could be learned from the European prison system. On the next Where We Live, we'll hear how the commissioner is implementing change here, including emphasizing dignity and opportunity for inmates. That conversation on Monday. Now, you can't argue that food is a natural way to connect people with very different backgrounds. There's a new program in New Haven that's using food as a tool to foster understanding between diverse cultures. Joining us from WNPR studios in New Haven is Amelia Reese Masterson. She's executive director of City Seed. It's a New Haven-based profit that runs the Sanctuary Kitchen. Amelia, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Lucy, for having me on. Before we hear about Sanctuary Kitchen, tell us about City Seed. Sure, yeah. City Seed's a nonprofit here in New Haven. Um, we run farmers markets and we work on food security programming in New Haven. So, our mission is to engage the community in growing an equitable local food system that promotes economic development, community development, and sustainable agriculture. So, we focus both on farm viability in Connecticut and then also food justice and food security issues in New Haven. And this idea for Sanctuary Kitchen, tell us about it and uh, you know, why now? 
Right. Yeah. So Sanctuary Kitchen is a program of City Seed, um, closely working in partnership with a network of community volunteers. Um, it was launched just last month, and uh, the objective is to promote and celebrate the culinary traditions and cultures and stories of refugees who are newly resettled in Connecticut, um, as well as asylum seekers and new immigrants, um, while also providing um, an opportunity for income and to, to build their resumes and build connections um, that may help them with employment in the future. So our tagline is cooking up community with our refugee neighbors, and I think um, you know, the focus is really building relationships and using the vehicle of food to do that. You mentioned it's fairly new. Tell us how some of the events have un, you know, been unveiled, and who are the people that are making this food? Tell us some of the personal stories of them. Sure, yeah. So we just started last month. Um, there's a team of about uh, six of us who have been working on this since, since last year, and we launched our first event on April 23rd. Um, so what we do is we, we host a series of events, cooking classes, demos, um, also supper clubs where community members can host um, an event in their home. And these are all led by refugee cooks from various countries. Um, and so the first one was a Syrian cooking demo, which was held um, at City Seeds Commercial Kitchen in New Haven. Um, and it was um, hosted by three Syrian women who are recently resettled to New Haven, and they taught us um, you know, it was basically like a, like a food show would be on Food Network. So they taught us um, how to make fatouche, a Syrian salad, uh, kofta, um, a, a yogurt sauce, and then um, a traditional dessert that's usually made during Ramadan, a taif. Um, and, you know, while, while teaching us about the dishes, they, they were able to tell some of their stories, tell about how they got started in cooking, um, some of them shared, you know, personal stories about their families and their lives um, coming to the U.S. Um, and we have a, a number of events also coming up. Um, we've had our first supper club event. It was hosted by a couple, a Syrian couple, um, in a home um, of one of the volunteers here around New Haven. And, um, you know, they cooked an elaborate meal and hosted about 20 people to sit around the table with them, um, talk to them, get to know them. Um, ask questions and just understand who who are their new neighbors here in New Haven. Mm. New Haven has a reputation for being welcoming uh, with the uh, with Iris, the immigration uh, resettlement agency right in town that helps so many uh, new immigrants. It's a welcoming city. You know how valuable would this kind of program be in other parts of the state? Uh, we know that there are church communities, uh, say in West Hartford and Middletown, that have also sponsored uh, refugees as they come into this this uh, community into the state to learn about um, not only America, but for Americans to learn about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a good model. And I think what sets it apart is, you know, it's not just a supper club. It's also um, classes and, and people can have a hands on experience learning alongside, um, you know, their refugee neighbors. So I think um, I think it's a model that that should be repli replicated and could be easily. Um, for us, we are, you know, this is the first year running this, and we have about three events a month. Um, we're also building a pilot program for food entrepreneurs. So this year we're going to be piloting um, uh, a program that supports um, refugees who are interested in starting a food business with business skills and training, um, information around um, legal requirements and licensing, and um, sort of just getting through the red tape that's that's required to start a business. So, you know, we had a Syrian couple come into City Seed yesterday who they've already put together a catering menu and they're really interested in, in getting started. They've been in New Haven about six months. And, um, you know, they said the hardest thing for them is facing just piles of unfamiliar bureaucracy and not really knowing how they can get this business started. And they said, you know, we want to start this business as an on the table of business, not an under the table business. And, and we just don't know how. So I think also the, the food incubator, the kitchen incubator um, portion of the program is really important for sort of longer term um, economic viability um, for refugees who want to start businesses. So it sounds um, like a it sounds like a tool for self-sufficiency because when refugees come into this country, they're expected to be employed at a certain period of time. Exactly, yeah. So IRIS does a great job hosting refugees here in New Haven, and it, you know there's some income um, provided through the government for about the first three months, sometimes stretching longer than that. But 
but refugees are really expected to find a job in that time period, and that's extremely difficult. Um, and so I think a program like this is a good resume builder for people. So we've had cooks that have said, can you, you know, can you issue a certificate so that I can put it on my resume and show that I've, I've cooked for, for events around the community? Um, so not just the incubator, but also just the experience hosting an event and standardizing a recipe, talking about food, um, and, and getting the connections um, to do that. You know, going forward. This is where we live. We're speaking with Amelia Reese Masterson, Executive Director of City Seed. It's a New Haven based nonprofit. And they've got this new program called Sanctuary Kitchen, where uh, refugees in the community prepare traditional meals and invite the community to learn about uh, their culture. Uh, Amelia, we, we can hear that there's benefits to the refugees uh, um, in doing this, and, and everyone loves to share uh, their background. But what about people who are not immigrants, you know, who've lived in this country all their lives? Any stories that you've heard from them who've come to these events? What are they learning? Yeah, actually, there's been an outpouring of interest in this. So I think, you know, as a result of, of the election and then um, the the ban on travel, which effectively bans refugees. Um, we've had many community members who have been motivated to do, you know, whatever they can to support refugees in New Haven and have come to us and called us and said, you know, what about hosting um, a cooking event for refugees or is there some way I can donate to support, um, to support refugees to get involved through farmers markets? So there's been a lot of interest and we, we receive, I would say, a few phone calls a week about that. Um, so this program really helps channel some of that energy. And, you know, there have been people who have stepped up and said, I want to host an event in my home. Um, and it allows them to bring in their friends and family um, to, to learn who is a refugee. You know, refugees are our neighbors. They're, they're professionals. They're mothers and fathers. Um, they have stories. And I think um, a lot of the, the hate speech and the fear and ultimately misunderstanding around refugees in the current climate um, needs to be countered, and this is a way that relationships can be built. So, yeah, we, every event we've had, we've had two events so far, and we have um, four more on the docket, and all of them um, are selling out, you know, within a week. So I'd say there's a lot of interest, and people come with good questions, and they want to sit and talk with um, the hosts of, of each event. Uh, we are almost out of time, uh, Amelia. The next event, I believe, is on Mother's Day. Can you tell us briefly about that? Yes. So we're, ho we're hosting an event called Make Mamul, Not War. Um, it'll be about uh, making Syrian cookies. Um, it'll be led by um, four Syrian women. And, um, you know, it is on Mother's Day. So come bring your mom, make cookies for your mom, um, but also learn how to make these Syrian cookies. It's going to be held at City Seed on May 14th. Um, and actually, that event is sold out, but we have a few more events coming up. Um, there's an event about making Syrian stuffed vegetables on May 19th, um, and there will be a few more on the docket soon. So you can check the website, sanctuarykitchen.org or cityseed.org to find out more, um, and also to donate to support the program. Amelia Reese Masterson, again, Executive Director of City, Se City Seed, rather, a New Haven-based nonprofit that runs this new program, Sanctuary Kitchen. We'll uh, have information on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Amelia, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. The show was produced by Jeff Tyson. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. Special thanks to Lydia Brown. And WMPR's executive producer is Katie Tolarski. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. As always, thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend.